Hey, we're going to go over um, the new board members for OpenAI, and uh, we're going to talk about where the hell's Ilya Suskerberg, what's going on there, and then look at some reactions online. Uh, this is a sick podcast, talk about business and AI and comedy. It's a comedy show, we make fun of people, we make jokes, like, and we curse every now and then. So if you don't like it, like, I don't know, go to, go to Lex Friedman and go to sleep. Uh, this show is usually hosted by two Googlers. Um, first Googler, Joe Dranaski, is out by Hawaiian Island. I am the second Googler. My name is Jordan Thibodeau. Um, I specialize in murders and, I mean, murders and acquisitions. No murders and less caught. If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Uh, if you like business, AI, and comedy, then hit that like and subscribe button. So new, new news, 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 news about the OpenAI board. Looks like Sam Altman is going to be back. So let's read that press release and then dig into um, what's going on with these board of directors. We're announcing three new members of the board of directors, Dr. Sue Desmond Hellman, former CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Nicole Seligman, former EVP and general counsel at Sony Corporation, and Fiji Simo, CEO and chairman of Sicard. Additionally, Sam Altman, CEO, rejoined the OpenAI board of directors. So Sam's back. Sue, Nicole, and Fiji have experience in leading global organizations and navigating complex regulatory environments, including backgrounds in technology, nonprofit, and board governance. They work closely with the current board members, Adam D'Angelo, Larry Summers, and Brett Taylor, as well as Sam and OpenAI Senior Management. Brett Taylor and Chair of OpenAI Board State, and I'm excited to welcome Sue, Nicole, and Fiji to the OpenAI Board of Directors. Their experience and leadership will enable the board to oversee OpenAI's growth and ensure that we pursue OpenAI's mission. Dr. Sue Desmond Hellman is a nonprofit leader and physician. Dr. Desmond Helen currently serves on the board of Pfizer and the President's Council of Advisors on Science Technology. She previously was a director of Procter & Gamble, Gamble, Meta Facebook, and Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute. She served as the Chief Executive Officer at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for six years. From 2009-2014, she was Professor and Chancellor at the University of California, San Francisco, the first woman to hold the position. She also previously served as the President of Product Development at Genentech, where she played a leadership role in development of first gene-targeting cancer drugs. So, um, seems like she's well-connected in the government, well-connected in corporate, checks all of the right boxes for having a wide network and professionalism and be able to launch things and knowing what it's like to be involved in companies. So I found some clips of uh, her speaking. Let's take a gander. It usually served me well. Um, I, I now tell people if I'm their mentor because I do a lot of uh, um, mentoring and I'll say, you know, the one watch out is I'll say, you can do that. And you might say, so I can't actually do that. I've never learned how to do that. And we might have to adjust the timeline or figure out how to learn. But I find it's, it's been an asset because I think it's that one of the values we had at the Gates Foundation I liked the most uh, was demonstrate respect. For me, my optimism when it comes to people demonstrates respect. It says, okay, you might say you're not ready or capable of doing this. I believe in you. So let's figure out what that looks like. Okay, so yesterday um, there's an open AI forum that's invite only. And I got invited to it a couple of weeks ago. And every two weeks they have a, they invite us all together and an open AI person will either um, – They'll have some from the team presenting or outside researchers on different papers. Uh, one paper they did was about super alignment, how to get smaller models to teach larger models. And last, this week was about their head of their red, their red team for OpenAI, the team that goes out and just figures out how these models can be exploited and how to print them. Uh, she gave a presentation and I asked her, you know, how did you make the decision to launch GPT-4? Uh, what, 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 like, gave you the signal to do it. And he said, hey, here at OpenAI, we're an iterative company. We believe in iterative deployment where over time, you know, we're going to learn and we only learn by getting something out into the market. We're never going to be able to have all the answers if we keep things internally because you don't know how the product will react to customers and how customers work with the product. And so hearing what Dr. Sue had to say about this, where she, you know, believes in people that they can take a risk at something and they're going to figure it out and grow into it, I think kind of aligns with OpenAI's ethos of getting AI into the hands of people and not being like anthropic and not giving any AI until a competitor does it or like Google. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. Um, also, people who are looking to get mentors, uh, one thing I really suggest is that you don't go to someone and say, hey, be my mentor. Instead, figure out what the person's interested in and try to like share information with them. So if, there's a, if they're researching certain types of stuff, like find that type of research, share it with them, try to begin dialogue and go from there. Um, and you never know, like some of the best mentorships I've found were through that, but I never ever said, Hey, this person's my mentor or not. Because when you say to someone who's very busy, has a family and things on their plate, will you be my mentor? It's like a formal relationship. They don't know who the hell you are compared to actually just going out there and trying to find things that are interesting and letting the relationship build naturally. And then you see where it goes from there. 
So let's go to our next clip. I think comes, well, I'm patient that the world isn't more fair um, and safer and better. Um, the, the optimism I think comes, well, it's probably a couple of things. One is I just had um, so many wonderful uh, things happen to me in my life. <laughs> I, I, my, I have a, a sister one year older and she used to say, oh, that's happening. And Sue's going to do this because of course Sue's going to do that. She always has good things happen. <laughs> and she, Kathy was right. Um, I've just been so lucky that I think my innate optimism comes from um, uh, seeing so many good things happen in my life and experiencing so many good things. I'm, I'm really fortunate that way. But I'm also, I just love people. I love people and I love, um, I, I, I think it's easy to under. I'm just uh, so optimism, she's not a doomer. Uh, she sees the potential and opportunity, but she also mentions at the beginning, I'm impatient with uh, progress and injustices. And, doesn't, and those could mean poverty, sickness, issues people are dealing with. She wants to get these things solved. She wants to move forward. So what's interesting about picking her to be on the board is she's working with Bill Gates and the rest of them going to third world countries, seeing people die for lack of aspirin, seeing people die for due the not getting the right medical advice. And then hears about what ChatGPT can do and also hears from Bill all the great things. And she's probably like, Jesus Christ, this could solve so many problems for people around the world. Let's get this technology out. Like, I don't give a hoot about that deranged Jesus with a mustache and you talking about, like, the paperclip problem and how we're all going to destroy it. All I know is there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people dying every year for bullshit reasons if they just had the right type of assistance and help that this model could bring. So um, I think that's why she's a solid pick. Let's go to the next clip. A massive difference. I mean, this, this is not the mosquito that causes malaria, but if you could apply this kind of technology to anopheles, it'd be even more astounding. So um, I became obsessed with mosquitoes when I was up the <laughs> I think it's inevitable that one does. But the other program that I really like doesn't get a lot of publicity, um, but it was a program to look again at U.S. poverty. So it's part of the U.S. program and to look at poverty in the U.S. and what that means and how we might think about it so many years after the war on poverty and all these uh, early notions. So it was an updated look on how to change how we think and how we apply tactics for poverty. And I have to say that there were some people involved in that project that are now part of um, the Biden administration. And I see in what they do, things like childcare, things like support, um, ability to work. Just this is a good one for two reasons. One, her government connections. She has people in the Biden administration, knows people there. So um, seeing her working, on, being on the board is probably indication to Washington, like, here's another awesome person to put on the board who has her, who knows how business works, knows how to run a nonprofit and has government connections. So there is, I mean, there were adults here, but there's some children in the form of some of the other elements of the board that were let go, but now no adults here. Um, also, I like how she was saying, you know, they, she was looking at the war on poverty and the approaches they were using wasn't working. Let's try something new. And she's probably thinking of this technology too. What are the implications for that, for those social goals? Um, so that's really, really, really fantastic. Um, let's go to another one. Mentor, because I do a lot of uh, um, mentoring and I'll say, you know, the one watch out is I'll say, you can do that. And you might say, Sue, I, I can't actually do that. Just saw that one. Just kidding. They, um, my mom and one of my sisters both had breast cancer, um, HER2 negative. Um, and I just was so struck with difficult to treat breast cancer when I was in practice. And people were so pessimistic that you can make a targeted therapy for uh, metastatic breast cancer that to say I was thrilled that Receptin was approved. I mean, we worked night and day. Literally people at Genentech ran down the hill, put the, the vials in the boxes with the <laughs> package insert and put them on the truck so that patients would get them as fast as we could. That was for me, it, it said to me, you could do something I never thought you could do, you know, make a medicine that didn't exist before. That was fantastic. Um, just absolutely great. The, the other career highlight for me uh, at Genetic and then at, at UCSF, both the person who took my place was someone who I had worked with a lot and felt like I was somewhat of a mentor and a coach and they were ready to take my place. I think really good leaders um, never feel jealous if they have fantastic people working for them. They're excited about that and try and make them even better while <laughs> we're working with them. And that happened at, at Genetic and UCSF and, and actually happened at the Gates Foundation too. So each time I felt like I could go to, whether it was Bill and Melinda or the Regents um, and say, look, you have someone ready. 
um, that was that was really important to me. But the other thing that I loved being at UCSF was I had never had before so much the experience that every year there was this whole crop of dentists and nurses and doctors and PhDs and uh, pharmacists, and that we had all contributed to making the world better because all these uh, well-trained people um, had gone through. So a couple of things there. Um, she has the imperative to push for cures. She was mentioning about breast cancer and those issues and how she was just like, let's get this thing cured and solved. Let's go. Let's move fast and get things done. And that aligns with Greg Brockman, who has a wife who's uh, suffering from genetic disorders. And he looks at AI as helping people like his wife, plus others get cures or help doctors give them better information and make research easier for them. So she has the um, energy to say, let's go forward and make things happen and less of let's focus on doomerism and bullshit. Um, I also like how she mentioned she has people smarter than her underneath her taking, taking positions and moving up and replacing her. And she's secure about that. She's not an insecure person. Uh, you listen to Ilias Esquerd and whatnot. He was getting, as time went on, it seemed like he was putting too much of his ego into GPT-4 and believing all of his press, which led to him kind of being unglued. And we've mentioned that a couple of times. And you want people like um, the doc, Dr. Sue here, who is someone who's like, I don't care who gets the glory. I don't care if people beneath me, above me are smarter. All I care about is the work is getting done. So she seems like a really strong, you're probably hearing on Twitter. Oh my God, Claw 3, AGI. Don't worry, Joe and I are here. Put the kooks at bay. And we have just did record a video on Claude 3 Statistical Report. And is it actually putting pressure on open AI? And then we talk about um, New York Times dropped an article saying Mira Marty wanted Sam Altman fired, but they're also suing, you know, open AI. So we don't know what the hell they're, they're talking about. But if you want to learn, check it out. We also have an episode on the adult and entertainment industry meets AI for all y'all who like kinky AI stuff. And then we have an episode on dead tech companies walking. We then go into Microsoft engineer, share advice on integrating LM copilot into your product. We have overtime with uh, Martin Trapani for all you who want to learn about how to use a, uh, AI with healthcare. And then Joe talks about web agents and there's Joe yawning. And then we talk about alpha codium, um, we have 16 banger episodes here. We, we release one new one per week. And what's great is they're all ad free and you get previews. You can preview it too before you, before you decide to uh, give us five bucks a month so you can access them all. So you get two minutes of free previews for each video and five bucks a month gets you in. Plus you get a reading list, which is uh, summaries of Joe's latest research papers. He has read, you get those before we record. So you're all prepped, good to go. And there's some research we don't even have time to record because there's so much crazy news going on. So patreon.com forge less thick get ad free exclusive episodes that you can watch either on patreon or youtube talk to you later bye pick let's go back to the uh, the rest of this press briefing okay uh nicole okay nicole seligman uh is a globally recognized corporate civic leader lawyer she currently serves on three public company boards paramount global Maria GTX Holdings, PLC, and Intuitive Machines. Seligman held several senior leadership positions at Sony entities, including EVP and General Counsel at Sony Corporation, where she oversaw functions including global legal and compliance matters. She also served as president of Sony Entertainment and simultaneously served as president of Sony Corporation of America. Seligman has, currently holds nonprofit leadership roles at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center and the Doe Fund of New York City. Previously, Seligman has a partner partner in the litigation practice at Williams and Conley LP in Washington, D.C., working on complex civil and criminal matters and counseling a wide range of clients, including President William Jefferson Clinton and Hillary Clinton. She served as a law clerk to Justice Thurgood Marshall on the Supreme Court of the United States. So notice the theme. First person has government connections and nonprofit connections. Second person has the same plus nonprofits. They're basically showing like, and also though, these people have either run companies or someone's worked in private practice. So they're not pure academics, like their feet have touched grass and they know the issues involved of launching or launching great things and working with powerful people. More importantly, Nicole here has government connections. And then if you go over to, if you go over to, um, I was trying to look for Nicole on YouTube and I couldn't find any writings or anything. I saw Wikipedia, but um, it's interesting. 
her husband, though, he is kind of a political heavy hitter. Um, he was the American lawyer and school superintendent. He was chancellor of the New York City Department of Education, the largest public school system in the United States, serving over 1.1 million students in more than 1,600 schools. He was succeeded by Kathy Black in January 2011. But also, New York Magazine ranked Klein as one of the most influential people in public education. Klein has never obtained, uh, had never attained the common formal credentials that one would have to take leadership role in public school system. And Klein has a short, short duration of teaching experience, so kind of an outsider, well respected. But then what I found really interesting was, um, let's see here, there. Klein was rumored to be one of Barack Obama's candidates for Secretary of Education. Ultimately, the position went to the Chief Executive Officer of Chicago Public Schools, Arne Duncan, then to the New York State Education Commissioner, John King Jr. So, uh, another person with political ties and is a you know is married to Nicole, um, and so I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and also, she in August 2013, the Council on Cybersecurity announced that Sigwin's a member of the organization's advisory board. So pretty well connected in politics and also has corporate experience. So let's go back over here. Uh, Fiji Simo is a consumer technology industry veteran, having spent more than 15 years leading operations strategy and product development for some of the world's best leading businesses. Um, she is a chief executive officer and chair of Instacart. She also serves as a member of the board of directors at Shopify. Prior to joining Instacart, CMO was vice president and head of Facebook app. Over the last decade at Facebook, she oversaw the Facebook app, including news feeds, stories, groups, video, marketplace, gaming, news, dating, ads, and more. CMO founded the Met. Met Metrodor Institute, a multidisciplinary medical clinic and research foundation dedicated to care and cure for neuroimmune access disorders and serves as president of the Metrodor Foundation. Um, let me see what this is real quick. Metroda Institute's medical and research center focused on advancing cure for neuroimmune access disorders. Um, that's really interesting. Hold on, Greg. Right. Okay, I want to... I'm going to the Greg Brockman's post. Uh, reason we need beneficial AGI. This was posted, when was this? Uh, January 8th. After five years of pain across many systems of her body, a broken foot from stepping off the curb, deliberate, uh, debilitating migraines, fatigue, joint pain, and instability, etc. My wife was recently diagnosed with a genetic disorder called hypermobile ehlers danos syndrome. Because the medical system is designed for individual special specialties, while heads affects every system in our body, we spent five years seeing more doctors and specialists than in our whole life in our whole life prior. Most doctors would only focus on what was relevant to their own specialty. We were lucky that her allergist put together the pieces. Um, as human medicine has progressed, it seems like we we increase doctors' depth of experience and breath. We need better tools to be able to deliver uh, depth and breath simultaneously to patients. This is one promise of AGI if built right. Reliable, individualized, affordable health care in your pocket, like a plan like a panel of today's top doctors across every specialty working together in concert to keep you healthy. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting because then you have this is the institute that one of the board of directors founded, um, and they're focusing on uh, neuroimmune access disorders and whatnot. And so it seems like maybe I don't know maybe Greg connected somehow that helped influence getting Fiji here on the board. But let's uh, look at some of her videos. Market the grocery business, but not to food culture. You were I always put these things at one. There we go. Raised in a small town in France, in a fishing village, and I believe three generations of, of, of fishermen in, in your family? Well, uh, you know, I wasn't destined to end up in Silicon Valley, <laughs> clearly. Uh, I grew up in a very big, rambunctious Sicilian family uh, where food was always at the center of everything we did. And so, you know, it's kind of going back to my roots to, to go back into, uh, into a food business. I'm curious if growing up that way and, you know, sort of walking around, you know, with your, with your grandfather through the fishing village, did it instill this sort of builder mentality? Absolutely. I mean, my grandfather always told me, you know, I can forgive anything. The one thing I wouldn't forgive is if you're lazy. And so... Uh, the so work ethic was like deeply, deeply ingrained in my family. And they always made me feel like everything was possible if you worked hard at it and if you poured your heart and soul into it. You were the first one in your family to graduate from high school. I just want to <laughs> linger on that for a moment. That's incredible. You know, the, the fishing industry was interesting in that they take enormous pride in what they do. And so that reminds me a lot of what I've seen with grocers uh, in the industry right now, reading every customer at the door. Like that reminded me of the pride that I saw in my family for a job well done and, you know, making sure that the food was perfect and fresh. Uh, and, and so th these are things. So she seems extremely well grounded. Comes from a like a seems like almost like a blue collar background. Um, 
first in their family to get education. Probably also has been around a lot of folks in the community who've been either impoverished and things like that. So she knows what it's like not having information easily accessible to your fingertips. So maybe she's thinking like she wants to be part of this too, because then she can help people in similar situations. Um, so that's a really cool person they got there. Let's watch this clip. Make sure this is not on 2X. It is my bad to founders, CEOs, or really anyone who is, is struggling, worried about being discriminated against, worried about being judged. A lot of what makes you different can be your superpower. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time trying to fit in. I even took accent reduction classes at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And as you can tell, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, after a while, I was like, you know what, I'm going to stop trying desperately to fit in. And I'm going to like spend a lot more time thinking about what do I bring to the table that's different? I come from a very different background than most people in Silicon Valley. I have a different perspective. Uh, even my health issues have made me a much better leader because like I developed much more empathy for my teams. My biggest advice is like, think about what makes you different and turn it to your advantage. <laughs> Knowing your superpower is perfect for a segue into, um, this is like a little rapid fire. What is a secret power that you have that people don't know about? I think I am able to connect the dots between a lot of different ideas uh, in a way that helps me uh, set a vision that's, that's more compelling than just the sum of the parts. Who are your most powerful mentors? Hmm. You know, I don't like the word mentors. I like the word sponsor. I think mentors are people who like sit down with you and give you advice over a nice cup of coffee. And that's nice. But sponsors are the people who put their reputation on the table to open doors for you. Um, and so I would say Mark Zuckerberg has been obviously one of these people. Do you still talk to him? Absolutely. I mean, when do you call him? What kind of counsel do you seek from him? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, in the tough times when I'm realizing uh, that the CEO job is obviously very hard and lonely and realizing how much I learned from him about that, uh, you know, pinging him and telling him like, hey, am I doing this right? Is this normal? Speaking of advice, best advice for someone in their 20s always give everything your best advice for women in particular about uh really solid in, uh, interview there by emily chang uh i thought that was fantastic for all, multiple reasons um one she's extremely close to mark zuckerberg and she has empathy for being for, empathy for founders um so i'm sure she She'll have a lot of relatable experience for Sam Altman and would know what's going on in his mind to kind of help him and help facilitate what he's doing. Um, so I thought that was really good. Also, you know, her di her diversity and thought and how she does things and seeing that as a superpower and not looking for conformity. So true diversity of like fishing village background, uh, thinks differently on certain things like that. That's the type of diversity that we it, we, we want more of a, a Silicon Valley. We want people from different backgrounds. Like when I did the Looker Act, when I was working in the Looker Acquisition, their customer service team was mostly veterans um, or, you know, people coming from just random walks of life that had, would never have exposure to Silicon Valley. And they had an extremely diverse um, customer service organization from not just the color of the skin, but on their life experiences and what they've seen and what they've done. And that does become a superpower in its own right. And having people who have divergent thought processes and think differently so that you can really sanity check ideas to make sure you're, you're including different, um, you know, uh, ways of going about solving a problem and you don't have any blind spots. Um, sometimes Google falls into that because group think e easily happens in large organizations. Let's go to the next clip. Amazon is shutting down a lot of its physical stores, its four star stores, but it's doubling down on groceries exactly. with Whole Foods and its Amazon Go stores. You want to take on Amazon. How? Well, we want to help our grocers have all of the technology they need in order to compete with Amazon. To your point, Amazon is investing very heavily in grocery and they have a ton of technological abilities. And that was a big part of why in my first week in the job, I decided to acquire Caper, uh, and, and, which is a smart card technology, because I want all of the grocers we work with to have the same uh, edge that Amazon has. And so I see, I see it as my responsibility to build all of the technologies that they need to compete with Amazon so that we can be the antidote uh, for, for them. Then there's Uber and DoorDash and GoPuff and go outside the United States and the list goes on. How does Instacart stand out from all of these different players that are competing for a piece of that pie. These players fundamentally compete with our grocers. They want to uh, attack the market by being first party retailer, owning their own inventory. And so uh, that's not our approach at all. Our approach is really building technology and fulfillment to help our grocers. The second thing is that these players are very focused on one particular uh, piece of the market, which is quick commerce. And while that's really important, and we've certainly seen our own convenience business double in the last six months, we actually address all of the needs that consumers have. We're not I like what I'm hearing. Now, you could say, her being the little person going after Amazon is analogous to OpenAI fighting against Google right now. And so she knows what it's like to be the underdog. And I'm sure her views of surviving against competition from Amazon and thriving 
are going to be valuable to Sam Altman, which is really nice. Also, she knows how to do acquisitions. She, they did an acquisition there of that sensor company. And you never know, OpenAI might be considering acquisitions. Or also, when Sam was trying to set up this fund to do corporate investing in things, um, the kooks of the former board were like, oh, you're going too capitalist here. Like, what's going on? Um, uh, uh, F- uh, Fiji, I'm thinking her name wrong, but like, no, Sam, that's exactly what you need to do. You need to, there's certain areas that OpenAI needs to actually invest in, invest in different companies or start markets in because eventually as this product gets better, we need to make sure we have third party, third party uh, builders or communities or different markets built up so that we can continue to grow our products. So that requires us to start our own kind of like a little corporate development arm that makes investments in these companies, or maybe we acquire companies. So um, I thought that was really great. Um, I think the board picks are really gr- fantastic. Now, here's another question. Where the hell is Elias Suskerberg? No one's talking about that right now. So let's go over to Twitter and um, take a look. Uh, let's see here. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It's very important. You should do that. Uh, here's here's Bindu Ready. She says, um, let's see here. It says, no, where is it? Ilya is not reinstated the OpenAI board. Where is Ilya, and what did he see? Um, I, <laughs> I don't know if the last part was a joke, um, but I think what he saw was, well, <sighs> what did he realize? That he went over his skis, and he puffed up his ego and thought that, you know, I'm we're going to get rid of Sam, and then I'm going to go to OpenAI and to OpenAI employees and say, now I'm in charge. And all the employees are, oh, what? And Ilya probably also thought like that all, not all, but some great inventors who create great ideas think that, you know, by the fact that I've created something great, I can do whatever I want, or I can ignore the politics of an organization. It's a typical fantasy of some people who are on, on of some, 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 some people who decide to prioritize the uh, value of what they created over the human relationships, where are, which can be just as important in regards to actually getting the value you create to the market and getting it accepted. So uh, I think what Ilya did it was, you know, had ego issues, and I've explained that in the last episode and episode, episodes before. He tried to make a power play, tried to do a coup de tat. It failed. He saw that all the employees supported him. He apologized on Twitter, and based upon an episode we haven't released yet because of this latest information, um, it looks like he's been kind of on in the penalty box and the sidelines for for a while. So, it'll be interesting to see because he reached out. He has a, a an employment attorney uh, representing him right now in the organization. So. He could be on his way out. I could be wrong. We'll see how it happens. But it's just he's poisoned the well here with OpenAI, and now you know it's it, Sam can you know be be good and say you know we're we're even and you know everything's good and let's move forward and whatnot. And he can be genuine and sincere about it because Sam's an adult. There's too many things to focus on. But at the same time, it's not just Ilya's relationship with Sam. It's it's relationship with all the other employees in OpenAI now. And what they're worried about is what do their managers think about um, Ilya? And if I get too close to Ilya, will some of his drama be uh, be uh, will rub off on myself? And will people think differently of myself? So typically, in these organizations, you have a lot of folks from other organizations that are highly political. And so people are worried about their reputations. And so Ilya might right now feel like he's kind of on an island. So, and that's what typically happens when you try to do a failed coup. And usually when you fail your coup, though, you move on. But there could be more information that we're, we haven't seen yet. Um, this is Fiji saying, this is back in October of last year. When I joined Instacart and told people that Instacart was also a healthcare company in the making, people thought I was insane. But now it's obvious that the companies at the center of people's relationship with food have a critical role to play in health. So she's kind of out there, divergent thinking, um, and uh, she's fine with going against the consensus. And that also ties to when OpenAI first started, a lot of people thought they were insane for thinking about the idea of building AGI in some form. Um, Fiji said, we need better science. What's happening, and this is back in oh, January this, this year, what's happening to patients with complex chronic conditions is grotesque, and we should be ashamed of the lack of progress. The tools are here to change this. Let's use them instead of dismissing patients. Hell yeah, girl. Preach. I feel the spirit. And this aligns with Greg Brockman and what his wife is going with, going on, going through. So like, this is, this is awesome that she, she, she's seeing these things and she wants this technology deployed. 
Okay, here is her responding on February 15th to Sora. As someone who grew up inventing magical scenes that unfortunately could only live in my head, this is literally blowing my mind. What a time to be alive. A time when our kids will grow up with so many more uh, tools to express their creative birthright. Congrats, Sam and Greg. Amen. So she's very pro on the technology, and she sees what the opportunity is here. Now let's go to Adam D'Angelo, who's still on the board. Um, it has been productive process the last three months working with Brett, Larry, Sam, and Greg to improve OpenAI's governance. I'm excited to welcome Fiji, Nicole, and Sue today, and I'm looking forward to working with Sam and the company. I think these changes will lead to better working relationships between the board and the incredibly talented people and leadership at the company, leading to better collaboration and oversight as well as we work to work towards mission together. Okay, sounds good. Um, and then we have Garrison Lovely. OpenAI is increasingly behaving like a normal company. Uh, E.g. reinstating the hyper-successful founder CEO, not publishing an embarrassing report, but what they're doing is far from normal. Their top employees think that that the work they're doing could literally drive human humanity extinct. Um, I'd love to hear more about that, and maybe what Elia was talking about, but he's kind of been acting like a crank the last year. Uh, given these stakes, there's a strong case that OpenAI's investigation of the firing should be made public, a.k.a. open. So that's that's what's going to be the next um, the next battleground. So for the kooks, uh, the OpenAI haters, the QSTAR people, the AGI people are going to say, well, they're not releasing the whole report. And probably somewhere in the report it says AGI and QSTAR. If it did, they would have been mentioned, hey, there were some um, radical – new product developments that actually justified how uh, Helen Toner and the rest were, uh, were it was smart for them to get rid of Sam because he had AGI and he was going to release or something. Nope, that wasn't said. Now, here's the reason why they don't want to re release those 30,000 messages in the whole entire report because kooks are going to get that report and people who hate OpenAI will get that report and they're going to be able just to pick certain things out of context and then it's going to lead to even more kerfuffle and shit like that. Um, I actually didn't expect for them to come out with this report and actually tell us what's going on because they said back in December we're doing a 30-day investigation and that was back in December so I expected something like we'd see something like late January, didn't see anything in February didn't see anything, so I was losing hope. And the fact that it came out this week, I was like, wow, okay, at least we know what's going on there. So to me, it, it looks above board, and I just don't see what we get about seeing all the gory details and what they investigated. And also a lot of stuff in there is just like too long, didn't read, no one cares. Or you might also have um, th uh, information regarding their strategy and their product design and what they plan to do next. And of course – people who are behind uh, Elon and, and crew want to see what's going on there so maybe they can try to catch up. So anyways, hope you enjoyed the episode. Um, me and Joe record some more episodes this, this morning, but like I'm tired. I got these videos out now and I'll probably release them on Monday or something. So I hope you all have a good weekend. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. Please go to patreon.com forward slash fic. If you like to see episodes like this, like supporters, five bucks a month goes a long way. You could add free episodes, exclusive episodes that, um, that you will appear on Patreon and also on YouTube. And for five bucks a month, you get access to that. Plus a reading list. Talk to you later. Peace.